All right, guys. Appreciate you guys being here tonight. Had a little excitement with a lizard. You've heard about the squirrel going berserk. So, if any lizards run up your pants leg, just pretend like you get the spirit, you know, and, and uh, have at it. All right, when we get done tonight after we sing, I've got a little something special. Last week I had a poem. And those of you who missed last week missed the poem. It was Mr. Doug's birthday, and so I had a birthday poem for him last week. But I got something else special for you that hopefully will make you laugh. So um, we'll end on that note tonight. All right. So we are continuing. We started last week in this journey through the life of Jesus. And tonight we're going to be looking at the temptation of Jesus. Okay? And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3 and 4. So that's 90% of where we're going to be. So if you want to go ahead and be finding that, that'd be great. Now here, here's an observation for you. Okay? Temptation always caters to self-interest. Temptation always caters to self-interest. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not, but when you're tempted, it's something that will benefit you, something that benefit me, right? I'm never tempted to be selfless, right? <laughs> I'm never tempted to, to be generous. I'm never tempted to watch my caloric intake. Those are not temptations for me, okay? Um, because here's the deal, being selfless being selfless takes intention. It takes discipline. And, uh, when we're, and being selfish just is a natural thing. So that's the natural thing to do. And so when we're selfish, we, of course, hurt ourselves and oftentimes hurt others as well. So for um, these 10 weeks that we're going to be in this study, we're going to be following Jesus from the time that he was introduced to the world, and we looked at that last week, until the time that he was sacrificed for the world. And so throughout the series, we're going to be coming back to this overarching theme that Jesus showed up to do something brand new. He showed up to, to bring something brand new to the world. And as we looked last week, he, brought, uh, he came to introduce a brand new covenant. Before, the covenant was between God and a nation. And now the covenant is between God and everybody, God and mankind. So he's replaced that old covenant. And then he also came to introduce a new command. Do you remember how many commands the Jewish folks tried to follow? We talked about that last week. It was 613, I believe. A lot of, and, and all those were biblical uh, commands that they had to memorize and try to follow. So we reduced that all down to two, which was basically love God and love others. And then before he ascended, basically narrowed that down to one, which was go, teach, baptize, all that. And so that new command ushered in then the new movement, which was the church, okay? Now, as we think about Jesus and his life and what he did, uh, we may think that the religious leaders just kind of, yeah, whatever, you know, kind of put him off and didn't really listen to him, but they were paying close attention. They were paying close attention the whole time because, here's the thing, Jesus wasn't coming to promote Judaism 2.0, right? He wasn't coming to do something, um, hey, here's Judaism new and improved. It was something brand new, completely, completely brand new. And if you remember from last week, uh, the, the saying was, those who profit most from the status quo are the least inclined to let it go, okay? So who, was the mo who, was the st who profited most from the status quo of that time? What was the religious leaders? They profited the most from what was the, uh, the current system at the time. So they resisted what Jesus was, was trying to do. And that tension between Jesus and the religious leaders existed all through those three or so years of Jesus' ministry. So last week we looked at the guy who introduced Jesus. So we're going to briefly recap. What was his name? John the Baptist. That's right. Um, if you remember, we likened him to kind of being the warm-up act. Right, like you go to the. I was talking about all the concerts I went to at the Pine Bluff Convention Center back in the day, and you sat through the warm-up acts to get to the headliner. Right, and so John the Baptist drew these huge crowds with his new message of repentance and baptism, because remember, repentance and baptism was something you did uh, structurally. I mean, there was a hierarchy of things, and you had to do these certain things in the temple and all that. 
he was out baptizing and asking people to repent right there. So that was kind of bringing in something new there. And so once he drew the large crowds, then he drew people's attention to Jesus. In fact, last week, you remember he said, look, look, there's the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not just the sins of us, not just the sins of us Jewish folks, the sins of the world. And that was something brand new. Because, you know, as God's people, they thought, well, it's us, nobody else. But no, this was for, for everybody, a brand new concept. Then Jesus makes his way down to the Jordan River, and he insists that John baptize him. And um, this is kind of backwards. You know, th- this whole thing's kind of upside down, backwards, brand new, all that. Be- uh, and it's, it's backwards because John's been preaching, come, repent of your sin, and be baptized. You know, show that you've died to your old ways and you're starting afresh. So here comes Jesus, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God. He's come to take away the sin of the world because he has none. And he wants John to baptize him. You know, John's been telling the crowd, hey, here's this great guy. I'm unworthy to, you know, carry or untie his sandals and all that. Um, And even though I've been on the scene first in ministry, he's coming later and he's greater than me. And all that. And here's, here's Jesus down in the water wanting John to baptize him, which is kind of a symbol of, of Jesus submitting to John, you know, being under his authority, yet Jesus is greater. That's, that's kind of an upside down thing. And what did John do? He said, Mm-mm, no, wait, wait a minute. No, I, you should be baptizing me. And, and he's right. You know, he, he didn't really feel like he had the, the right to do that. I don't have any business baptizing you. And, and there again, that's that backwards upside down part of the norm but that's the whole point this was kind of the first clue that this upside down nature of something brand new was coming not something just improved but something brand new that jesus was going to introduce to the world well all that prefacing to get to matthew chapter 3 so i'm going to read matthew chapter 3 verse uh, toward, toward the end of the chapter there verse 16 and 17 we'll finish out the chapter there it says as soon as jesus was baptized he went up out of the water at that moment heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighting on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son whom i love with him i am well pleased well like i said a little bit ago John the Baptist was the warm-up act, kind of, to Jesus. So imagine you're at a concert, and you sit through the warm-up act. You're ready for the headliner. You're ready for that main attraction, and the lights dim. And this booming voice comes over the intercom, over the the speaker system, and it uh, it says, now presenting the world-renowned, and then you you fill in your favorite band or artist or whatever, who this is. But instead of them performing, they just walk off the stage and disappear. That's kind of what happens here, okay? John the Baptist. Look, there's the Lamb of God. He's, he's great. He's, I'm unworthy. Here he's baptized, and, and what happens? We look in chapter 4 at the very beginning. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert, okay? He's, he's, um, and to be tempted by the devil. So that, that's, what, uh, that's what's happened here. Instead of Jesus starting off with the bang and, and starting his ministry and saying, hey, this is what you need to do, he was led off into the, into the wilderness, to the desert. You know, we think of a wilderness as, you know, being the forest. Wilderness was really the desert area. And, and why was he led there? Why, why was he led there? To be, to be tempted. Well, goodness, that doesn't sound like much fun, does it? Um, the three Gospels that, that tell this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all say that Jesus left immediately and disappeared into the wilderness. In fact, it says he was led by the Spirit. So you know, God is, this wasn't just an accidental, coincidental meeting. He was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Now, we get a couple of different uh, terms here to describe Satan. And the first one we have here is to t- be tempted by the devil. The devil, the Greek, is diablos. Does that sound familiar to your Spanish-speaking people? Diablo is devil in spanish right that's where the root word where we get that word diabolical so here's a little bit of trivia for you okay if you're ever asked what's the most obvious statement what's the most obvious statement in the bible here's how you should answer matthew 4 2 let's read that matthew 4 2 says after fasting 40 days and 40 nights he was hungry 
Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? You know, I can't, I, I get hungry after 40 minutes of fasting, much less 40 hours or days. I can't even imagine. So you, th- you think that's kind of a, one of those duh statements. Why would you include this? It's, it's obvious. After 40 days, he was hungry. Well, yeah, anybody would be. And, and here's, here's the point, I think, because Matthew, as he's writing this, as well as the spirit who's inspiring him to write this, wants the readers, their initial people who hear this, to know, as well as us centuries later, to know <coughs> that Jesus was human. He was a person. Um, do you remember what um, John 1.1 1, 1 says? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, John or First John one one says something very similar: that um, that which was from the beginning, Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands and have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. See, John makes a point here of saying we've seen him, we've touched him. You know, th- this wasn't a ghost. This wasn't an apparition. You know, this was. This was a real flesh and blood person. Um, an apparition, a ghost, doesn't get hungry. Jesus did. Yeah, was Jesus God? Yes. But for these, his 33-ish years on earth, he was also human. And even after his resurrection, you see him on the beach eating fish with the disciples. So, um, anyway, all that point, I think the, the, the most obvious statement in the Bible is there just to, re, just to reassure us, just to make it sure that we know that Jesus was human. Okay, he just wasn't out there. You know, he was human. He was, he was hungry. All right, we get to Matthew 4, 3. The next verse says, the tempter, okay, there's our next word for, for Satan. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell those stones to become bread. All right, first we had Diablos, now we have the tempter. And that tempter means uh, the inquisitor, the the tester. And he says, hey, you're the son of God. If you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. I would have done that in a heartbeat. But I'm not the son of God. Um, So in, in other words, just speak it. Just speak it. If you're the son of God, it will be done. You know, if you can speak the universe into existence out of, with, from nothing, then sh- certainly you can say, hey, let's turn these stones into bread. Could he do it? Certainly. Certainly could have. And Jesus responds. <clears throat> let's see, where are we at here? Make sure I had. Oops. Yeah, where is verse 4? Let me go back here. Hold on a second. I may have not. Yeah, I've got to read that verse here in a minute. So Jesus responds to this temptation by leaning into the old covenant. And here's what he answers there in, in verse 4. He says, this is how he answers Satan. It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay. So, like I said, he's, he's leaning back on this, this, this covenant of Israel. He's, he's quoting out of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um. In Deuteronomy 8, it was written, uh, it's talking about when, when um, uh, Israel's traveling through the wilderness, there's nothing to eat, uh, just like Jesus, in the wilderness, nothing to eat, right? And God provided manna from heaven for him. Now, in that time, God was teaching his people, this is back in Deuteronomy, he was teaching them to depend on him every day, every single day, daily dependence, day in and day out. Not only, not only that, but then he, he finishes that, that verse by saying, you don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in other words, even though Jesus is saying, even though I am the Son of God, I'm not going to act on my own. I'm not going to act independently of the mission that my Heavenly Father sent me on, because to do so would be to do what the kingdom of the world wants me to do. But I'm here to present something new, something upside down. All right, let's look on verse 5, 6, and 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Well, back in my um, later teenage, mid to late teenage years, as well as early, early married years, uh, I went to church at Southside, 23rd and Poplar, right? And they had a little, little um, byline, little motto or whatever. It was the church with the lighted spire. Okay, and that's because on Poplar Street, you'd go down it, and there was this spire, had a cross at the top, and they had the light shining on it all the time. So it was the church with the lighted spire. Now, as I'm reading this as a child, even, even maybe even as a young adult, I'm, I'm picturing Jesus and Satan somehow getting beamed up to this point of, on top of the temple, like, like that like Southside's point on that spire. And I don't really think that's the thing. I don't think they were beamed here and beamed there and, you know, not, no Star Trek stuff going on here. They probably just walked to the temple. They went up the highest point was this um, southeast corner of the temple, and you could look down there into the, the Ken, uh, Kendron Valley, and it was a very, very deep valley. And so the tempter, the devil, says to Jesus, okay, you're the son of God throw yourself off. People are going to see that. It's going to be a big deal, right? And then the devil quotes a Bible verse out of Psalm 91. Um, because, you know, hey, if you're going to quote scripture, I can quote scripture too. And, and so he, he taunts Jesus by saying, didn't God promise to take care of you? He said, uh, here, he'll command his angels concerning you. You won't strike your foot against us. Don't. Didn't he promise to take care of you? Don't you have faith in God? Come on, Jesus, don't you believe in him? You just said in the previous temptation that you live by every word that comes out of the Father's mouth. Here's some words that come out of the Father's mouth. Can't you trust those? Can you see the little temptation going on here? And so... In this moment, Jesus is, is tempted to do what often we're tempted to do. And that is he was tempted to try to use God, to manipulate God. And unfortunately, that's kind of where a lot of people in their faith are these days. That if they um, just believe enough, it'll happen. Uh, if they can quote the right verse, if they can say in Jesus' name enough times or whatever... Um, that God's going to come through. But Jesus answered this temptation and said it's written not to put the Lord your God to the test, which is out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. So, so the point for us in, in this temptation here is that as believers, the moment we try to manipulate God, the moment we're looking for that magic formula, and I'm not saying we can't pray earnestly and pray for something and even say in Jesus' name, but if we think that... Um, that God then has to do this for me because I've said this thing and I've done this thing and I've said the right set of words, whatever. At that moment, we're not really practicing Christianity. We're practicing, we're kind of practicing voodoo, right? That's where you do the incantation. You do this, you do that, and something's supposed to happen. It's the, um, um, what do you call that? Um, bending machine religion, Right? Put in the right amount of stuff, pull the handle, out comes the blessing. Okay? That's where a lot of people are. But see, Jesus didn't come to the earth to give us everything we want. Just to say, hey, do these right things, everything, you know, you're going to get it. In fact, he would later in his ministry teach that when you think of God, you know, don't think of him as this king in heaven, sitting there waiting for you to bring enough uh, gifts and sacrifices and offerings and prayers and good deeds he, he said later on, from now on, think of your perfect heavenly father who already knows what you need. You know, he doesn't need to be talked into it. He can't be bribed. You just come as children who simply ask. Okay? That's how he wants us to present ourselves. Okay, so now we get on down to the third temptation. This is really kind of the, the main event here of the temptations. And this third temptation is really going to be repeated throughout his ministry. So let's look at that in verses 8 through 11. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. That's pretty gutsy, isn't it? And in verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. 
So again, the devil took him. I don't think they were beamed to this high mountain and took him. Um, there again, there's a lot of walking involved here, and he's just gone 40 days without eating. He's got to be, and, and you know that that's when usually, isn't it? When we're tempted the most is when we're at our weakest, right? And so, just another lesson to to be learned here. So anyway, he takes him to this very high mountain, shows him um, all the kingdoms. Just look around. You know, you can look north, south, east, and west. See all these cities and and th- kingdoms and stuff that's around. And then also, you know what's beyond that as well. And he says, isn't that why you're here, Jesus? Isn't that why you're here is to set up your kingdom on earth? Here, I'll give you these kingdoms. All you have to do is bow down, worship me. What do you say? Come on, what do you say, Jesus? But here's the thing. Jesus didn't come to barter for a kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom not on earth but in our hearts, in the hearts of men and women. A new upside-down kingdom. It's a kingdom where... The subjects of the kingdom weren't required to lay down their lives for the king, but that the king would lay down his life for the subjects. And a kingdom, this is just another upside down thing, a kingdom where an individual's wealth and his talents and her gifts weren't meant just for that individual, but for other kingdom residents as well. And so we've done spiritual gift studies. We've, we've seen that, that we are gifted, not for ourselves, but to help others, to help the church. So, Jesus says what? He says, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then it says, the devil left him. And so, in in Luke's account of of this same story, it says, he left him until an opportune time. In other words, there's round one. Okay, I'm coming back for more later. We're not finished. So, we're going to talk a little bit about temptation. Now, we've already stated that we're tempted to do things that that benefit me, right? I'm tempted to benefit things that benefit me. It's self-centered. Of course it is. And that's the way of the world. That's the way that the kingdom of the world works. So I'm going to turn over uh, real quickly and read to you 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. It says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world... The cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he uh, has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Okay. A few years ago, I actually preached on, uh, on this section of Scripture here. And we're going to see how that, that tr- translates in, in, into our temptations. And I'll show you that here. We're going to look at this chart. I'm going to make sure that our online folks see this chart as well. So here's... And, and the King James actually states it a little bit differently than I just read it there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay, so we have the tempter Satan. And here's these three categories of temptation that we fall under. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Now, when we think of, of lust of the flesh, the first thing that, co- that comes to mind is, is, is sexual temptation, which is part of it. But it's anything that appeals to our uh, senses and it, it appeals to to our cravings and that could be any pleasurable thing or any drug abuse food abuse anything like that okay lust of the eyes deals with with power and greed and i want that you know it's that coveting that's what power uh, 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 lust of the eyes is and then there's the pride of life that's uh, i'm setting myself up as god and I'm, I'm, I'm tempted with, with wisdom, and I'm tempted with how I'm seen by others. It, it's, it's, it's the um, per- perception, you know, that I want to, to, to portray. Now, if we go on to the next uh, slide, we see we're going to go back to the Adam and Eve story. And how does this relate to, uh, to Eve? Well, when Satan presented her with the temptations, he said, hey, it's good for food. That's a lust of the flesh. It's pleasing to the eye, lust of the eyes, and it, it's, you can be as God. You can have all this wisdom and be as God. It hit at the pride of life level, okay? Now, let's go on to the next slide, which is Jesus' temptations. Hey, turn these stones to bread. There's the food craving, okay? Lust of the eyes, the, 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 the stuff, the kingdoms of the world. And then, hey, throw yourself off the temple, how are others going to see that? They're going to think, uh, they're going to notice you, and they're really going to you know, fall for you and, and, and worship you then. It's the pride of life. So it's the same thing. 
Same thing out that the, the first John mentions is, is Satan's same old tricks that he uses. All right, we can get off that uh, slide there if you'd like. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure you know this, but the, the four Gospels give us bits and pieces that we can put together to get a complete story of what goes on, right? Now, if we went back to John chapter 2 and we see Jesus' first miracle was where? At a, here comes the bride, right? At a wedding, that's right. And he turned water into Welch's grape juice. Is, I think that's what the Greek literally translates as, is um, turn the water into wine. And why did he do that? Well, his mama alerted him to the situation, didn't he? Didn't she? Uh, said, hey, you know, they've run out of wine. And so he went from there. And so that was not necessarily right after this um, temptation, but it was real, real early in the ministry. And so the moral here of the story tonight is don't listen to the devil. Listen to your mama. Right? Is, that the, is that it? And I think many of us would probably say we'd be better off if we didn't have listened to the devil and did listen to our mama. Right? And we'll do testimonies later on that. So here's, here's the real point. Jesus, early on, was offered at some level what we all want. Power, respect, and authority. And, you know, we just kind of naturally crave those kind of things. But he refused it because Jesus did not come to take over. He came to take away the sins of the world. In fact, Jesus, at the, at the end of his time on earth, and we're going to see this several weeks down the road as we look at this in detail, Jesus, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And as many times as he's, he's told the disciples this, they still didn't, they didn't get it, you know, uh, about the new kingdom, how this is going to work, because they thought, we know how authority works. Um, there's a top person, and then there's the next level down. You have this hierarchy of things. So Jesus, um, we know you're the top guy here, so who's going who's gonna to sit at your right hand and your left hand? But they're, they're, you know, they're wanting, as much as Jesus is trying to set them straight, they're still stuck in this system because you know, this is all brand new to them. And Jesus is, is, is kind of like a hinge between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so these disciples are kind of stuck there in the middle trying to figure all this out. Um, and so he gives them a little lecture about, and we'll see this in later weeks as well, that even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, to give his life or ransom as many. And so, and so that's what the kingdom of God is. It's, it's, it's how Jesus modeled his life self-sacrifice, service, putting the needs of others above his own needs, and not just that, but above his own rights as well. We, we kind of hint, we kind of camp out sometimes on our right. That's my right, and I'm not giving it up. Jesus had the right to stay in heaven. He gave up that right, released that, uh, to volunteer to come to earth, to live that sinless life, to die the cruel death, not as a not as a robot, not as a hologram, not as a spirit or an apparition, but God incarnate in the flesh, a human that bled, felt pain, all that. That's a king dying for his subjects. That's upside down, isn't it? Well, the reason we're tempted every single day of our lives is, is to get away from this kingdom focus, uh, to, 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 to think about power and wealth and influence, good stuff, all the, the, the stuff for me. But as Jesus taught in this new upside-down kingdom, the first is going to be last, last is going to be first, power is going to be leveraged for the powerless, not against them. Wealth would be leveraged for those in need. Influence would be leveraged for those without a voice. But as we, as we remember about the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, Change doesn't sit well with those who benefit the most by leading in the same. And like we said, those powerful religious leaders. And that's why they conspired with their invaders, their captors, the Romans. They got together and executed this rebel. So as, as we, just a couple of closing thoughts here as we, um, but before we sing tonight. And there's, just remember, temptations always center around yourself. Whenever you're tempted to do something, it's, it's something that, that you're weak in. Um, you know, some things, my temptation may not be the same as yours. You know, we, Satan knows exactly where those, these things are. 
And so as we see here in, in, in the Gospels that with the temptation stories, that temptation itself is not a sin, right? I think we know that, so just, just remember that. Temptation's not a sin. Yielding to it, that's, that's where the, the sin is, right? Martin Luther, I just love this, this saying, had the saying that you can't help when a bird flies over your head, but you can help it if it builds a nest in your hair, okay? Meaning what? That you're going to go through life, you're going to see things, you're gonna, things are going to pop into your mind here and there and everywhere, and those things happen. Those temptations happen. What you can help is when you sit there and you think about it for a while. <laughs> that's, that's where the sin comes in. And you think, well, I should do that. I should, well, yeah. And, then, and you yield to that. So, all right, that's where we are for tonight. So we'll continue on in the life of Jesus next week. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing. Just a minute. What, Scott? Okay. Well, we'll pray, and then um, we'll see what happens. Let me do that. I can't pray, pray for 20 minutes probably, but no, we'll, we'll see. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for our night. Lord, thank you for your word and its truthfulness. Lord, we, we thank you that we can um, learn from it. Lord, that we can learn from your example of what to do and um, how to not yield to temptation, Lord. And as we see that uh, Bible quoting is, uh, Bible memorization is very, uh, very important to resisting temptation because it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard not to yield to something when you don't know what it is you're not supposed to yield to. So, uh, Lord, just remind us of that as we go through our lives for the upcoming weeks. Uh, Lord, to, to stay in your word, to stay students of your word. Lord, I know we've got a lot of things going on in our lives, a lot of things, uh, especially in the summertime when we're very busy. But, Lord, we, um, we certainly want to keep focused on you. So, Lord, we, we love you very much, and we thank you for this night. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to sing in a little bit as soon as, as, soon as Bob's able to, to come in. But we're going to um, tell our online audience audios for now. So thank you guys for tuning in, and um, come back and see us next week.